got your Bibles, be turned over to uh, uh, John chapter uh, 14. We'll be in that passage today in John 14. <laughs> if I asked you, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas, what would you say? You know what I didn't get. They asked me, they said, what do you want for Christmas? Now, when I was a kid, and many of you remember this, you know, one of the things that you got for Christmas was socks. And, and I said, you know what I really need? I need some new socks. Well, guess what I didn't get for Christmas? Socks. I, you know, I got some great things, don't get me wrong, but no socks. And so maybe I could say I didn't get everything I wanted for Christmas because I didn't get new socks. Now, don't get me wrong. The Lord's blessed me enough. I can run out if I want to and buy me some new socks. But they specifically asked me, what do you want for Christmas? I wanted socks. You know, when I was a kid, if you had said, what do you want for Christmas? I was on a new bicycle. I want a, you know, G.I. Joe. I want a rock'em, sock'em robot. You remember those babies? Boy, they were something else. I never did get one until I got old enough to where I could buy it myself. Those things like I wanted. But now, when, back when I was getting those packages, you know, you remember watching the movie, A Christmas Story, and they're unwrapping their presents, and they pull out this package, and both of them get them at the same time, and they look, they got socks, and they look at each other, and they just go, toss them babies. When you get older, your feet become more important, don't they? You like those fresh socks. I wonder if we ever stop and ask ourselves, have you got enough? Would that be something that you could answer? Something that stuck with me in my mind is a couple of years ago, I was in the hospital with a family member of a church member. They weren't members of our church, but I'd come and because the person was near death and they were on their deathbed, and they'd asked me if I would come by and speak with them and, and, and pray with their family. Now, the man that was sick had uh, two sons, and, and, and one of them was a leader in the local church. And, and, and so it was a Saturday, and as they sat around talking together, uh, you know, the discussion came about about what the family was going to do that evening and the next morning on Sunday morning. And, and so the patient, he's unresponsive, and sadly, you know, two days later he passed on. And, 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 and so he didn't really know where, where they were and what was going on. And, and, and so... I believe in faithful attendance of church services, but also understand there's going to be these circumstances that are going to come up where you know, it may not be possible or even feasible to attend church. And, and so anyway, uh, the, the younger son who, who you know, was there with his family said that they were going to get up the next morning and, and go to either an early service at one of the local churches because they were from out of town or they would attend Sunday school somewhere. And so I appreciated that, that they were willing to still want it, even though they were having to come in, they needed to feel like that connection with the Lord. And, and, and so then the older son, who was a leader in his local church, he, he made a statement that has stuck with me ever since then. And here's what he said. I have enough Jesus. He, 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 you know, now he's a leader in his local church, where, you know, where he was, and, and he made the statement, I have enough Jesus. In other words, he was basically saying, I'm not going to church. I don't need to go to church. I, I have no need for it. And, and, and so that sentence has been burned in my brain, and, and so I got to thinking about that as I was preparing for this message. You know, Jesus did say we'd be recognized by our fruits, and, and so I think that particular piece of fruit was one that was kind of sour to me when I heard it. I understand what he was getting at. I don't have to go to church tomorrow. I can you know, stay here. With, if he had simply said, I'm going to stay here with Dad, y'all go ahead and go and, and everything. But it was just his attitude in which he said, I have enough Jesus. I found a poem by Wilbur Reese entitled $3 Worth of God. Now, here's the way he would write it. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a black man or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I, I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want about a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Let me ask you, how much God do you want? I mean, is there ever a time where you just feel like I've got enough God? Well, I thought about that, and we think about Peter in the upper room with Jesus here in this passage in, in, in John chapter 14. And Jesus is there, and he ends up taking a basin, and he, he gets down, and he grabs a towel, and he, and he washes the disciples' feet. Now, here's, read this passage with me in John 
14, verses 6 through 9. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would, want, uh, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you, you do know him and have seen him. Now, here's what Philip said. Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Hmm? There was somebody that was close to Jesus, spent a lot of time with him, said, I've got enough Jesus. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, I, I can't help but think about Peter's response to Jesus. If you know anything about the passage, at first he refuses to let Jesus wash his feet. Uh, and then Peter is not comfortable with Jesus serving him in, in any particular manner, especially lowering himself to that. But once Peter understood he, he stated he wanted Jesus, and, and he wanted more of him. He wanted all he could get of Jesus. He didn't simply say, I've got enough of you, Jesus. I'm in your room. I'm in your presence. I get to listen to you teach. I, I recognize who you are. Uh, he's the one that made the great confession. You, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I mean, I, he recognizes who, who Christ is. But once he understands that he, even this, this God of creation who comes down as we celebrated his birth over this past week, that came down and was willing to get on his hands and knees and physically serve him. He said, well, if you're willing to do that, he said, don't just wash my feet. He says, wash my hands and my head as well. You know, he said, if you need to, give me a bath. I can't get enough of you, Jesus. That's really what he's getting at. And so I want to ask you again, have you got enough? And so as we face the new year, I pray that we're going to all be more like Peter here. We want more and more and more of Jesus in our life. You know, it's too easy to get comfortable. And so this morning, let's just think about some ways to get more Jesus. Not simply say, I've got enough. One way we can get more of him is more time in his word. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us in Romans ten seventeen. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Now, I think too often many of us are looking for this strange or mysterious or maybe even this supernatural event that's going to take place in our life or have some religious experience that where we can just say, I finally found God. I finally got enough of Jesus. But that's not what God is looking always to do in our lives. For some, it needs to happen so that he can really kind of give us that little slap in the back of the head and says, I've been here all along. But for many of us, it's that constant walk. It's that developing in our relationship. Too many of us want this special something to happen. We want uh, to suddenly become more spiritual, suddenly become more knowledgeable, suddenly to be better able to handle life. You know, since I found Jesus... Well, that would be a good series lesson, maybe. But what we're talking about is God is always working. Paul tells us here in this passage in Romans that most of the time it comes through a rather ordinary means. Now, we're not saying the word of God is common and it shouldn't be dealt as such. But what he's saying, you've got it at your disposal. It, it is pretty much everywhere you can go. It's the most publicized book and published book in all of history. There's no reason why you say, I don't know. I don't have enough Jesus. I can't get enough of him. I don't know how to get it because maybe we need to have a little bit more time in his word. And once we know what God says, we'll be better able to please him. Now, I want you to think back about those gifts you received for Christmas. I received a coat. You know, I, I received nail clippers, which I forgot to put in my pocket. I keep losing those things. I, I received shirts. I, I received just great things belts and i mean i received stuff but think about the ones you got and some of the best gifts you got most likely were from the people that 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 love you and know you the best i mean i received a gift from uh we do a chinese gift giving thing at my wife's family down in jacksonville and, and so I, I i i stole a gift you know and i stole it because my wife said get that get that because i was number four you know Somebody got it, and it was just Carolina Panthers throw, you know. Now, I like the Carolina Panthers, but I don't lay around the house with throws and stuff like that. When it's time to cover up, most of the time I go to bed. But she saw it, and she thought about, we're going to re-gift that and give it to Trey for Christmas. <laughs> get that. Get that. So I'm like, 
I'm sorry to have to do this to you, you know, and I grabbed a gift. And you know how those things work. The third person that gets it, it can't be stolen anymore. And it got down to the last two people. Last, and the whole time I just put it on the table and I walked away from it so as not to draw attention to it. I'm over here holding my granddaughter, and we're walking all around by the door and everything. And so if anybody saw me, you know, think about me, they say, oh, he's got the baby. They're not really thinking about that, 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 that throat that's been rolled back up neatly and put back in that bag, you know. Hopefully it won't be seen. It's standing up on the bag on the table so it can't just jump out at you. But it's in plain view. It's not like I hid it anywhere. I just hid it in plain view. But old Joe, Joe Slick, my wife's cousin's husband, he had his eye on that thing the whole time. And so when time came for Joe to get his number, he didn't even hesitate. He didn't walk by the table. He didn't go anywhere near the table with all the other gifts that were on it. You know what Joe did? He walked right on by. And he picked that bag up and he walked right on back. He says, can't be stolen no more. <laughs> so even when Amy's turn came around, she couldn't get it. You know, we always got that one special thing that we think that we really want and we have to have. And it, but, you know, the gift I ended up with when I finally walked back to the table, I said, well, I'm not going to steal anybody's anything else. I walked over and I got another. It was a big bag. I said, well, maybe it's another one. It's about the same size bag. It's something else. You know what was in there? A bag of marshmallows. <laughs> it was. It was a bag of marshmallows. And this funny-looking stick. It was like metal stick-looking thing, shiny red thing. And I was like, what in the world? And it's only about this long. And I opened it up, and we finally took the little plastic off of it, and it was something you roast marshmallows with. Now, you know, how often am I sitting around in my house and said, I think I want to roast some marshmallows. And with a stick that long on top of that. It didn't expand, sometimes because we don't know people very well. We don't always pick the best gifts, do we? The best gifts that we get are from those who know us the best, who love us the most, and who are really paying attention to what we really need. That's what God did when he gave us his word. That's one of the greatest gifts you could ever have. Second thing we need to understand is if we want to have enough, and more of God, we need to have more time in our prayer life. Now, we, we spend time emphasizing prayer in our church services. We spend time emphasizing prayer on, on our Wednesday night prayer meetings. But prayer is a common weakness I find out in most Christians' lives. And the reason I could make that statement is because I are one. And sometimes I find that though I am a Christian man and I'm supposed to be a leader, spiritual leader, so to speak, sometimes I find out in all the things that I'm doing in, in my life and even from the ministry of the church that one of the areas that may get neglected is my own personal prayer life. And I believe we all pray, or at least we try to do that. I hear a lot of people tell me over and over again concerning their prayer lives how they, they realize they, they've got to struggle with it and they need to do better with it. And, you know, I've tried all kinds of things. I've done the journaling. I wrote lists. I, I, I write out my prayers about things that are really important. And I want to make sure that I emphasize those things with God and, and it just reiterates in my mind why it is so important. But so far, the most successful thing that I've done as far as my prayer life is just making them less formal instead of more formal. So when you hear me pray a lot of time, you hear me ver being very conversational with God. I'm talking to him just like I would talk to Andy. I, I don't try to make God common, but what I do is I want to be in a, a, a communication with God where it's almost like I'm comfortable enough that I could approach him that way. And, and so I make my prayers conversational. I don't worry always about saying the right things and the here for us and there twos and, and all those kind of things. That, that's not what God's really looking for. He wants an open, honest communication with me. And when I get in that, when I get in those serious times of prayer, those are the times where I feel like I've been praying 10 minutes and, and I happen to look up and look at what time and when I say amen and I've been praying for an hour and 10 minutes. I mean, there's just a genuine connection with the Lord. But I wonder why we have so much pro problem and trouble in our lives when it comes to prayer. What I really think it comes down to is a lack of desire. I mean, really, you got to stop and you got to really focus and concentrate. And, and we live in a fast-paced world. I mean, we don't even watch commercials. Anyway, used to, a commercial came on and, 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 and it, they would show you the entire commercial. 
We live in such a fast-paced world now that when they run the credits and the, on the end of a TV program or something like that, they put it in a little bitty box up there and it's running like 100 miles an hour. You can't see it, but by law, they have to show you the credits. But you could never watch them if you wanted to. And they're going right out of one program right into the next one. This one's going off, and they've already got this one started. And this commercial was on while this one's on. They're cutting the commercials off 15 seconds. And now I don't care if they cut them all out. But what I'm getting at is we have adapted that into our own personal life. We want to speed up everything. Mark Lowry told a story about Bill Gaither. There was this Walmart commercial that was on, and they were advertising something. And he said it was just very, he was telling about how, how, uh, you know, touching that particular commercial was. It was years ago. He said, and wouldn't you know, God has a sense of humor. He said they were in their prayer circle holding hands. They were all knelt down praying. And, and then he says about that time the TV was on the background and that Walmart commercial come on. And he said, said, said Bill was praying. And he says, uh, 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 he says, uh, amen, bye-bye, God. As, as Mark Larry said, he said, Bill Gaither hung up on God for a Walmart commercial. Do we ever do something like that? Have you ever just shortened your things? I mean, you're, oh, I'm tired, God. You know what's going on. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> or you're rushing to do something, and, and, and you fail to remember that, you know, I haven't prayed about it, so let me hurry up and pray. You, you ever did the little prayer where you know you need to pray for your meals, and you go, Lord, I just thank you for this meal. And then and all of a sudden somebody says, you hear something clanging or doing, or you think somebody's going to steal it off your plate. And say, so God is good, God is great. Let's talk about what's going to be Amen. 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 It's like you're selling them a Buick or something. You're trying to auction them something off. We go right through it, don't we? But we need to be more de deliberate about our prayers. And so I think that's the reason we have so much problem is we, we have a lack of desire sometimes. I believe the lack of desire comes from a lack of commitment and a lack of knowledge on how to pray. Jesus' disciples once asked him uh, to teach them how to pray. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Obviously, there was something special about the way he was praying. He said he was praying in a certain place. He was delivered about what he was doing. When he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. John the Baptist had taught his disciples to pray, obviously, or it wouldn't be recorded in Scripture, would it? He said, you need to be talking to the Father. If we're going to be serving the Father, you need to be talking to him. And, and I believe the disciples saw the power that there was in Jesus' life and his ministry when he prayed. He saw, they saw something different taking place. It's not just the answers to those prayers that are important. It's, it was about what was taking place. And there's some changes that were happening. And there's changes that take place in us when we're deliberate about our prayers. Jesus said he often went off by himself and he prayed somewhere. He went off early in the mornings. And when the demands of the day begin to pile up, he's ready for them because he's already prayed up over them. He, he prayed for strength. He prayed for guidance. He prayed for the blessings of the Father. He prayed for you and I. You don't believe it? Or you just read John chapter 17. He specifically prayed for you. He said, I don't just pray for those who are here. I pray for all those who are here to message that come after them. He's prayed for you. He spent a lot of time about it. And the disciples saw the results of Jesus' prayers. And, and it's significant in, in what they, they did not ask Jesus to do. They said, they didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to do miracles. Jesus, you're a great teacher. Teach us how to teach. Jesus, uh, you know, you have to deal with a lot of pressure. Teach us how to deal with pressure. They didn't ask him to do anything else. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. That man can pray. You ever heard somebody knew how to pray? And you ever said, boy, I wish I could pray like that. That man or that woman knows how to talk to God. I bet that God listens to every word that comes out of their mouth. You ever known people that way? And you said, boy, I wish I could sit under them and, and have them teach me how to pray. I used to have a deacon that was serving in our church in, in Nashville, and he would come forward sometime at invitation, and, and, and we would talk about different things and during the week, and he would come forward in, in the invitation. He says, you know, I just want to be able to pray better. Would you pray with me and I can pray better? I mean, you know, invitations don't simply have to be about accepting Jesus all the time. It's about petitioning God to help you in an area of your life that you need strength. And so several times in my ministry there, his, 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 his request was that I need to pray better. I just need to be committed to God better. Then I can be deeper in my relationship with him. And it starts with me being able to pray. Have you got enough? Do you need more of God in your life? 
third thing we can understand is we need more time with God's people then. If we need, if, unless we feel like we've got enough, we need more time with him. You know, we find out all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, don't we? In creation, one thing that was not good, you remember what it was? It's not good for man to be alone. That's what he said. It's not good for man to be alone. I would make a helper suitable for him, so he gives him Eve. And, you know, we know that creation story. We know it's about Adam and Eve, and they're having their first relationship and the marriage and everything that takes place. We even know how sin came out of that first relationship. But what we need to understand is God understood that we were social creatures and we needed people in our life. That's what he really got down to. He said every, every, every other living thing has a mate. It has a companion, but this man has no one. and He needs someone. He's social. He's going to need people. And I believe that's one of the things that the church provides for us. It, it, it provides opportunity to hear God's word. It provides opportunity for us to pray. But most importantly, I think, is anything we understand we can be around God's people. We see God living and connecting and loving through other people. And occasionally I talk with people, usually in the hospital, who can't imagine what it was like for people without a church family. I mean, they tell me all the time, I don't understand how people can deal with it. I love my church family. I don't understand how people could get by without a church family. They've been there for me. How many times have you heard me stand up here on a Sunday morning and read a card of someone who's been in the hospital or gone through a difficult time? And, and, and what they always say, it is so great to be in such a loving church family and see God working in them. And so we need to understand that we need more time with God's people. Too many times we just say, I've got enough. I've got enough Jesus. We're like the man I talked about to begin with. I've got enough Jesus. I don't need any more Jesus. And that's not always the case. You can never get enough of him. At times, I've even visited some of your family and friends in the hospital. Now, I don't know them, you know, but I know you. You know, and, and so as a re result of that, they appreciate me coming, and they appreciate you mentioning them to me, and, and, and so I go and I respond, and other people in the congregation would do so as well. But it's a far different situation when I visit people who I know and I love and I have a history with. And now as I've been here for a period of time, I, I begin to know your story, you know mine. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe too open about my life and my story and who I am, but I want you to know me and who you're dealing with. And that's the only way we can be a family is, you know, know each other warts and all. And that's what God desires for us. And there's a depth to the relationship that simply means more than their, the problem that we're facing. Too many times we like to put people with problems at an arm's length distance. We don't want to involve ourselves with them. And church attendance is important. The Hebrew writer says in chap chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Christ's return. That's the day. That's the big day. That's what we're working toward. That's what we all say we want, but not just right yet. I got a few more things I want to take care of, God. Like he's going to be on our schedule. I'm getting to church. I know I need to go. How many of you ever said that? I know I need to be in church more often. I need to go more often. I need to. I appreciated Terry Lee admitting. He said, you know, one of the things I miss about being in church and gathering, he says, I don't get to be around the Lord's table every week. He said, I didn't know how much I would miss it until I missed it. That's one of the things that our coming together allows us to do. We, we need to remember also, though, as we read that passage in Hebrews 10, that, that it's more than just Sunday. I mean, in their world, Sunday was no different than any other day when it comes to that. I mean, before they went to work, they gathered for their little services and gathered and they prayed and they encouraged one another. It says, it let us not give up meeting together. You know, some were getting in the habit of doing that. Let us encourage one another. Boy, wouldn't you like a good shot of encouragement every morning before you got ready to go and do whatever job it is you got to do or face whatever you got to face? You got a doctor's appointment. You got to go over there to high school and you got to deal with those knotheads over there and you got to say, you, you know, you want to, you need some encouragement. We all need that. How do you think that would work out today if we all had to chose times to get together and meet together and talk and pray and say you got to be to work at, at, at 8 o'clock and for whatever reason, it takes you 30 minutes or an hour to get there. So that means you need to leave by 7 just so you can be punctual. And then let's say you have to be at church at 6 every morning. How do how you think our attendance would be in those services if we met on a regular basis? You know, but the truth of the matter is to, to be closer to God, we need to be closer to his people. That's what God desires for us. And, and, and we need to be able to be prepared to be delivered about that. I mean, look. 
somebody asked me, he said, you have a good Christmas? I sure did. He said, I bet, he said, is it hectic? Yeah, I mean, we ran for four days straight. We, the 23rd, we were in, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, to be there for a meal that started an hour and a half late. Now, you know where I had to be the 24th? Here, you know? And so I'm down in Jacksonville on the 23rd for a dinner that's supposed to start at 5. I'm thinking, well, 5, you know, we eat. We can fellowship and have some time with the family. We can exchange gifts. I can get my bag of marshmallows, you know. And, and then we can leave by 8. We've got plenty of time to get home. I can be home by 11. Well, we don't start until 6.30. So what's that mean? Dan don't get to leave Jacksonville until 9.30, quarter to 10. Then i got to drive all the way back to Roanoke Rapids. And as I'm there, coming back running rapids, you remember the 23rd was a rainy day. It was a bad day. And then you get these periods of torrential downpours. Now it's pitch black outside. And it's go through Kenston, you can't even see the road. I mean, it's just like you're driving across the pond. And, and, and then I'm like, see, if they just only had left, started. And so, I'm, you know, so now my fellowship time was not fellowship time. It was another reason why I should have stayed home time. And sometimes we do that with the church, isn't it? Would have 24th, you know, I, I, I've got family, my wife's mother and, and, and her husband, as my wife calls me. They, were, they came and they stayed with us and we, we got ready for our Christmas Eve service and so we were here, we went back, we had dinner together, we opened gifts and the, the 25th, you know, we go to Rocky Mount and my daughter's there. I've got to see my granddaughter pull the paper off the boxes and just look at the paper. I want the paper. I just want this little scrap. Of, but look, baby, this is a, I just want this little piece of paper right here. That's if I'm happy with that little corner. Can I just, and I want to put it right, right there. And, and, it, and, and it's, you know, but that's what we needed to see all that. The 26th was yesterday. I had to go to Kenston. You know, and we spent time with my family there. You, you see, it can get so troubling to find a way to find time to be in God's house and worship with his people because, you know what, uh, I've been running all week. I, I'm tired now. I just need time. I've got to get back to go to work Monday, and I ain't had a day of rest yet. Well, you know what God gave you? He gave you Sunday for worship and rest. Go worship and go home and rest. You see, God needs, says you're going to need some encouragement. Obviously, you're, you're, you're wore out, Dan. You need these people to encourage you. you. You're going to spend some time in my word today. You're going to have time for prayer. You're going to have time for fellowship with God's people. You need to know why you're doing what you do and that why all this other. Do you have enough of me already, Dan? Are you fed up with me already? That's what we tell God sometimes when we say, I got enough, Jesus. Really, what you're really saying is, I'm fed up with all that right now. I don't need no more anything else in my life. I've got all these other things going on. Now, I just gave you a glimpse of what my week held. That didn't count in getting calls about people being sick or falling off of a hoverboard or, or, or you know, uh, family struggles of people that have gotten some, their own trials that they've got going on. You've got to deal with those. And it is so easy to say, God, I've had enough. And today, is that what you've said? Have you got enough? You know, let me ask you, have you got enough God? I believe the answer for every one of us is obvious. We don't have enough of him. If not, I wouldn't have been standing there complaining about all the other things that have been going on in life. And the coming year is going to be on us next year. It's going to be n next year is going to be another year. Next week, huh? I'll see y'all next year. And for some of you, that's what's going to happen. Isn't it? I'm going to see you next year. In the coming year, we're going to need to be delivered in developing a closer relationship with, with Christ. We don't want to say, I've got enough Jesus, because what's going to happen when we say we've got enough Jesus is any little bit will be enough. It's like fruitcake. I, my father-in-law loves Claxton fruitcakes, but he don't like any other kind of fruitcake. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care for any kind of fruitcake. I've got one that was given to me two or three years ago. I found it upstairs in the attic. It was one of them little pre-packaged deals, and I don't know how it got in the little tote thing with the Christmas decorations and the ornaments. It's just a little small one, and I found it. And, and so, you know, I, that shows you how much fruit. I've got enough fruitcake. Somebody says, you want fruitcake? I say, I, I can always hold on to it. I say, I've got enough fruitcake. Well, what about you and Jesus? Have you got just enough of him to say, you know, I've got enough of God. I don't need no more him. I've got him put away. I've got him hanging from my mirror in my car. I've got him a little image of him there i've got a picture of him hanging on the wall in the house I, i've got a bible laying on my nightstand beside of my bed i've got a 
coffee table Bible in my living room. I turn the pages on it sometimes because it's got them big pretty pictures in it. And so we can, we can turn it and get a different picture. And I've got enough God. Or do you want to be more deliberate in your relationship with him? I pray that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, today's going to be a good day to start. You get a new year and a fresh start. That's where we're going to be heading next year. But I hope you don't ever say, I've got enough God. Maybe you got enough Christmas presents. I don't have enough socks. Anybody wants to know late last minute Christmas? I forgot the preacher. I'd take some socks. Dark, black, you can get them. Yeah. Wear it at, you know, size 9 to 11 on the package or something. <laughs> but all kidding aside, I pray you never say, I've got enough. But I want more of it. Would you be praying with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that today you bring us together. Lord, there are people that have gone every which way because they've been celebrating uh, this Christmas season and this holiday with family and friends. And so our numbers here today may look sparse, but we still know why and where they are. We praise you, God, that we can never get enough of you. That should be our desire. And if any time in our life we've gotten to the point where we feel like we've just got enough Jesus, that maybe we've missed out on the point. That, God, we, we, we need you to teach us more. We need you to teach us how to spend more time in your word and to pray. And God, we, we need to teach us that we need one another even more. So we, as Brother Bill mentioned early on, we just invite you. We give you permission to do that. We pray, Father, today as we're here, as we get ready to have this invitation, that as you challenge our hearts to know you better, that you open us up to do that. We also pray, Father, if we're not giving ourselves completely over to you and we felt like up to this point it's been enough and maybe you've spoken through this message today and said you know what that's been me i've kind of shut him off to the point where what i feel like was enough was never enough for him and i want to give him more so today god we we give ourselves to you and as we sing our invitation song if someone hasn't accepted you or wants to rededicate their life or have never been baptized into christ today is a good day we start a new life we start a new chapter of this series of, of what we would call just a walk with you. And, Lord, we can understand that we'll never be able to get enough. We get more hungry for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.